find my little, where, where did it go? All right. Welcome, welcome to the webinar today. My name is Lee Ramey. I'm the Youth Services Consultant at the South Carolina State Library. Um, today's webinar is made possible through an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant. Um, as you just heard, we are recording, so we will send this link out later. And what else do I need to say? I keep losing my bio. Hold on. Um, I need to read my bio. Huh? You don't need to read my bio. You don't want me to read your bio? How will I introduce <laughs> you then? <laughs> well, I feel like I have to read. Um, let me read just a couple snippets of it because the last part is funny. And I'm trying to find, sorry guys, hold on. I've got way too many tabs open here. Um, I forgot the name of our webinar, so that's what I'm looking up. Operationalizing, operationalizing diversity. There we go, equity and inclusion into action. And our speaker today is Mike Young. He's the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the Center for Community Health Alignment and PASOS under the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Um, he was the co-interim director and director of capacity building at PASOS where he worked to strengthen South Carolina's Latinx communities. Um, other interesting bits of info about Mike, his mom was from El, El Salvador. He lived in Puerto Rico. He's a poet. He used to keep bees. He has a giant tortoise. Um, he won the okra eating contest at the Irmo Okra Strut six years in a row. And he is the singer of a socially conscious rock band called The Habs. Yes. Without further ado. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the invitation to speak to you about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, working with Latinx individuals specifically. And um, yeah, thank you for all the great work you do of guiding imaginations to arrive at new ideas and realities. So um, as I as I go through this presentation, just make sure that I stay on point in terms of like, I want to make this applicable for you, right? And if I'm not getting to the areas that you want more information on, please just throw a question in the chat or even interrupt me. I can talk, talk, talk for hours. So um, I ask questions and I try and do my best at that, but you know, you never, sometimes you don't get them all. So please feel feel free to just interrupt me. Um, I like to make things conversational, fun, entertaining. Um, if you can turn your camera on, I like to see faces. It makes you feel a little more personable. And I got jokes, so I like to see the laughter when those hit. Um, but yeah, today's presentation is called Operationalizing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion into Action. And uh, we're gonna talk about basically things that we've learned, what we can share, how we can make things better, stronger, connecting, and reflect a little bit on our own positionality in society and what that even means. So yes, I am part of the Center for Community Health Alignment, which has PASOS in it. And PASOS is a statewide nonprofit that supports the Latino population. Uh, I'll get into more details about that in a little bit. And all of the Center for Community Health Alignment is under the Arnold School of Public Health at USC. My name is Mike. I'm the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So yeah, about me, you know, why, why should you be listening to me? I give talks like this often. Uh, before COVID, I did a lot of in-person ones, and I, I, I prefer the in-person ones. Uh, you can just really connect with people better that way. Um, this was me giving a keynote speech at CARE South SC's annual uh, conference. It was like 500 attendees. It was a nice, big, big event. Um, talking about implicit bias. So my background, talking about culture and people and identity and all these things, I came to South Carolina to study cultural anthropology. And this is me doing my research in Guatemala uh, with indigenous communities, they're Ekchi Maya. And I showed up, I, you know, I met them as a tourist one time and uh, they live in the piece of Guatemala that's just south of Belize on the coast. 
but you have to get to the city that's near them, which is not really a city, it's just like a little town by boat. And then from there, dirt roads through the jungle to their community. They've only had that road for like 10 years. Um, so they are Ekchi. I was the only guy outside, <laughs> only outsider in this community. And, you know, they're all taking turns, feeding me dinner and, and hanging out with me. And I get to do all the things they do, plant corn and whatnot. And, uh, you know, basically the whole point of me telling this story is that how did I earn their trust, right? How, why would they just let me in and tell me everything and let me play with their kids and all that good stuff, right? So we'll get to, we'll get to that. This is a um, typical house that they live in, attached roof, dirt floor, maybe a, a light bulb for electricity. That's about it. Uh, this particular family, I named their youngest daughter. Her name in Spanish is Bella Orquidia, which means beautiful orchid. And I have a goddaughter down there. So these people are my family, right? I'm probably going to go see them again in December. I've spent about a year living with them. So yeah, being led into community, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it can be done. And some of them only speak Ekchimaya. So I learned a lot of Ekchimaya. You say things like, Karuna Kachiye, which means, what did you say? Or Bandios Walsa, which means, thank you for the delicious food. Uh, so stuff like that. This is my own family. This is my daughter, Alice. She is uh, six now. This is my son, he, Max, he's four. And uh, yeah, my background, with, I, I incorporate all this social justice activism, awareness into everything I do. So this is me with that band that she mentioned. Uh, we've organized two rallies on the state house steps. This one was about voting, one was for DACA, and we play around town, the Republic Habs, and it's <clears throat> got a social uh, consciousness message to it. All right. So cultural competency, right? This term, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's got interesting implications and uh, definitions, but so the pieces I like to point out is this is all about the ability to understand, appreciate, and interact with people from cultures or belief systems different from one's own. But the main point, main word in that entire description is interact, because you can understand and appreciate all you want, but if you're not interacting in a dignified way, doesn't really matter. So knowing how to do that, how to how to shift the power and balance it's where those that we serve are the authority, the experts in their own experience, that takes some 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 mind shifting. Um, and also the term cultural competency. Uh, does somebody want to tell me what the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility might be? Without knowing too much, I would say that humility would be maybe understanding that you don't know everything and be willing to learn. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, competency has this, this connotation that like, okay, we did this thing, check. We did that thing, check, 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 done, right? I am competent. I can, you know, run a forklift and I can also interact with people in different cultures. Check. I'm qualified. Put, we put it on my resume. Not exactly. Um, cultural humility is a little bit less uh, definitive. It's a little bit more of that, yeah, there's always more to learn. You don't know everything. You can't walk into a community and pretend or act like you're the, the authority, especially on their own lives. Um, so making mistakes is part of it. And you need to make mistakes. That's how you learn. And people are gracious about mistakes. People are very scared to make mistakes. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Say the wrong thing. And then find out that it was the wrong thing and don't do it again. You know, people are cool about that. You know, we're talking about everything here, pronouns, talking Hispanic, Latino, you know, whatever the term is, ask first if you want. And then if they tell you it, use that. Um, but essentially, yeah, there's always, you gotta be vulnerable to knowing that you, you're gonna laugh at yourself and, and I mean, I, I, I made so many mistakes by going into that community and just being ridiculously overprepared to too detailed, to just clumsy, all sorts of stuff. But laughing at myself and laughing with them, that's probably a big piece of why they got, you know, why they let me in and were, were my friends. So if we're gonna talk about culture, 
uh, we got to think about it in terms of this thing. It's really hard to define, even for an anthropologist, right? Every anthropologist almost has their own definition of what culture is. So these are just facets of what culture is, because asking, asking somebody to describe their culture is like asking a fish to describe water. You know, it's just everything that you do, everything around you, you know, you don't know, you don't think about it, right? But what culture is, is their patterns of behavior that are common to a group of people. And that can be regional, it could be, uh, it could be virtual, right, virtual communities. But for example, then there's different sizes. Uh, there's American culture, there's Southern culture. There's South Carolina culture. When I first moved to South Carolina, so many times I heard, did you know we grow more peaches than Georgia? And we're very proud of that here. And so <laughs> that's part of South Carolina culture. Uh, and then there's also regional within that, right? Columbia, Charleston, Greenville, you know, got your color coatings, your purples and oranges and your blacks and your garnets, you know what I mean? You, you gotta know what you gotta do to, to fit in. So that's learned behavior, right? Nobody knows to do these things. Everything about culture needs to be learned. I could be raised, I could be, you know, adopted, raised in Thailand, never known my biological parents. I would speak Thai, act Thai, eat Thai, all those things, because that's all I know. And that's how culture works. It's whatever roots and uh, soil you grow out of. I told you I had jokes, right? So did you hear about who won the Bangkok Marathon? It was a tie. So other pieces of the, of the culture, this guy from 1920 uh, tried to break it into pieces and he did a decent job, but it was just him attempting to do that, right? So belief, art, law, moral, customs, knowledge, all these things, it's everything, right? And it changes. Uh, American culture, if you were to describe American culture, would you say, top hats, buggies, and Model T Fords? No, right? But it was, right? So now that doesn't describe American culture. So knowing that cultures change, they're always evolving, they merge, they blend, they're alive, and everybody experiences it differently. Everybody expresses it differently, and everybody engages with it differently. You know, there's a ton of diversity within all cultures. Uh, Latinx culture, I mean, we have like two dozen countries and each of them have their own unique identities. I'm from Nicaragua, you know, and sometimes Latino doesn't even work or Hispanic or all these terms. None of us call, none of us use these terms in our countries. When we get here is when we have to use these terms. So it's kind of like, here's the buffet, which one do you pick? Um, so we'll talk about the meanings behind the different terms, but just know that in their own countries, they typically refer to themselves as something else. Um, so Areas of difference between cultures that you can observe, individualism versus collectivism. Think about it in terms of like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You earn what you keep, work hard, get ahead. That's very much American idealism, meritocracy, right? You'll get ahead if you try harder. Collectivism is more along the lines of like, a principal doing Tai Chi with the whole kindergarten class, seeing themselves as a unit, seeing themselves as part of something bigger. These are all culturally defined. Same as masculinity and femininity, right? Uh, in Guatemala, those guys walk around planting corn with these satchel type purses that could be bright pink, bright purple with their names all over it. And they use it to plant corn because that's where the corn seeds go. If I were to walk around here rocking a pink satchel purse bag, I might get some funny looks, right? People might think, oh, that's a feminine trait. Why is that man wearing that purse? Uh, but in Guatemala, no, nobody bad to deny. That's a farmer. Just doing his thing. So these things are defined culturally. We have defined them. Um, power, distance, hierarchy, and authority. That's like who feels comfortable saying, let me speak to the manager, right? That is cultural. Feeling confident enough to do that. Looking people in the eye. Those kinds of things are cultural. Time orientation. Uh, we Latinos get a lot of ding for this one. But it's not just us, right? I know here in the States, our time orientation is early is on time, on time is late, late is unacceptable, right? But in other parts of the world, it's a little more flexible. And so, but it's not just us. Like I said, my buddy went to Greece and got on a bus just to go somewhere. And the bus driver just pulled over randomly, got outside and started smoking a cigarette. Everybody just had to wait. 
you know, <laughs> that's kind of part of the life there. It's the rhythm. That's what you do. And uh, got to kind of budget or, or just not be so stringent on your time frames in these kinds of settings. So people that come from these settings just need more reminders. You know what I mean? Like remind them, emphasize, parking might be hard, uh, work with them on their schedules. Uh, you know, when a lot of times we, we put, um, like how about Tuesday at eight and people might be like, yeah, sure. Okay. I'll be there. And then they don't show up because they might not feel comfortable saying no. So an easier way to get, um, more, I don't know, timid, I guess you would say, uh, individuals to, 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 to sign up for things like that would be checking with them. Right. So a lot of this is going to be asking people what their um, preference is, what their experience is, defining themselves. So making appointments, we always remind partners that um, tell the families, get here 15 minutes early, please. Uh, remember, parking might be difficult. If you don't make your, your appointment, you might miss it uh, and then have to be rescheduled. It's just not part of the rhythm that uh, some people are used to. I went down to Mexico. I was living there for a while and I went to a 9 a.m. workshop. And I showed up, nobody was there. And they were like, ah, pushy Americans. So <laughs> it's just different elsewhere. Thinking about, remember that thing I said about masculine and femininity being defined? Race is also culturally and it's defined regionally. Uh, race is a concept that is defined by physical features, skin, hair, eye, ancestry, right? These things tell people we have decided these are the groups you belong to. And they don't exist the same around the world. Different parts of the world, they have different racial groups. <laughs> uh, it's not as definitive as we think it is, right? And, uh, but the issue is, is that the impacts are real people in different racial categories are experiencing things differently because of the power dimensions and the perceptions and the way that people get treated based on how they feel about people and the way that they look, right? So the misunderstandings, the lack of information, and um, just, I mean, there's, there's discrimination, right? So yeah, race, not everybody even agrees on what race they are, right? And it will change, you know, these, these concepts will, will change because people are changing. Now, ethnicity is a cultural background. So, for example, when we talk about Latinos, we, there are brown Latinos who have a little bit more indigenous blood. Uh, there are white Latinos who have the history coming from England, Europe. There's black Latinos, you know, the, trans, the transatlantic slaves trade predominantly landed in, in Latin America, right? Out of the four million uh, humans that were extracted from Africa, only 10% went to the United States. The other 90% went to, a lot of went to Brazil, but throughout the coast and the islands. So we have Black Latinos. We have Asian Latinos. We have in Hindu and Indian. They call them Hindu in Latin America for some reason, but they're Indian from India, Latinos. And the reason why they're Latinos is because they've spent enough time there, generations, they get the rhythm and they, 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 they will kiss you on the cheek. They will stand certain distances from you. They will, uh, you know, go to their grandma for this and that or whatever it is that makes up part of that, 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 that aroma that makes up the ambiance of culture that defines Latino-ness. You eventually gulp it in and it becomes you. The term nationality, now that's a different one. That's dealing with nation states right? United States, Nicaragua, Luxembourg, these are nation states. If you live in these, if you're a citizen of these, that is your nationality. I find it a little irksome when I see somebody who could be brown, black, Asian, and then somebody says, what's their nationality? For me, eh, it implies a little bit of they don't belong here. Uh, where are you from? You know, <laughs> so Using that term correctly is, uh, is important. Any questions? All right. Not really a question, sorry. Um, you were talking about how things change, like the, the definition of cultural um, or culture will change. And that made me think about um, pink for boys, 
I mean, girls. And at one point it used to be pink was considered the more aggressive masculine color. And so it does switch and it does change and it, it can be hard to keep up with. <laughs> I read, I read somewhere that Sears, the, the company is actually responsible for starting the pink blue thing, boy, girl thing to be able to sell their products, you know, two of the same product, uh, one with a slightly different packaging or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I gave a talk on toxic masculinity and I dissected a lot of these, uh, these elements that divide genders or, you know, and a lot of it, there's so many reasons why we do it, right? Whether it be selling the same product twice or some sort of delineation or power imbalance, things like that. Yeah, but it does change and, and it's up to us. We either build it, dismantle it, reinforce it, maintain it, or build something new. So uh, when we talk about naming, his Latino names can be challenging. And this is gonna be a little bit of a guide to help you understand how that works. Uh, it's pretty much a patrilineal kind of um, format, I would say, structure. So you'll see the dad's names, the, the patrilineal names are gonna be on the left in red and the matrilineal names are gonna be on the right, uh, the mom's name and then his, the child's name is going to be dad's name, last name in the middle, and then mom's last name on the outside, like this. And if you look on the left, we got Jose Perez Ramos, you know, making a child with Margarita Garcia Aguilar. So his name Perez goes down to Juan Perez, and Perez in the middle, and her middle, which is her dad's, Garcia, goes down and goes on the outside. And then over here, Juan Perez Garcia and Maria Gonzalez Lopez make a child. Perez goes down again in the middle and Garcia goes away. Gonzalez goes down in the middle and Lopez goes away. So if we look over here, mat patrilineal, middle, matrilineal, outside, and it goes away. So a little bit of patriarchy there, right? Where only the male names matter. <laughs> uh, I, so that's, that's, that's how it works. And the thing is about these names though, is that both of those names are the last name. It's one name, sometimes separated by hyphens, sometimes not. Both of them, both of them are equally important. And oftentimes our systems, we input people wrong. We put them twice, up to five times based on the names, you know, and also people don't always go by their, uh, their name. Like, let's say his name is on paper, Luis Perez Gonzalez. He might go by, I don't know, let's just come up with a funny name. Uh, Chucho, right? He goes by Chucho and everybody knows him as Chucho. And then you find out his name is Luis. You're like, oh, but all of his documentation is Chucho. You're like, oh no, that's terrible. Uh, so just check, make sure what people's real names are. I honestly don't even know the real names of my uncles. You know what I mean? I got a Meme, a Lito, a Necta, a Morris, but they're all like Emmanuels and Juans. And, you know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so another thing too, uh, the two last names, it's not always common for the women to change their names when they get married. So here we got Juan Perez Garcia marrying Maria Gonzalez Lopez, and she is still Maria Gonzalez Lopez. In some other uh, older kind of fashioned traditions, you might see the de Perez, you know, de la, that kind of stuff. But that kind of has that, you know, old school, um, it's, not, it's not as in fashion as it used to be. And I think it smacks of patriarchy myself, right? Of Perez, about off red. So uh, what, do we, what do we do to help with that? Uh, documentation. We just ask people to ask for some sort of thing that has their official name on it to verify, right? Um, so that way you have some sort of consistency in your systems. And you can use birth certificates, passports, whatever. And one of our team members even says, put the names in all caps, the last name. So that way it really stands out. Okay. So what to expect from today? We're going to break down culture and our identities. We're going to how to interact with people from a different cultural background, recognize situations where cultural differences might play a factor, talk about techniques for handling encounters with individuals from different backgrounds, get some stories in there, because that's how you humanize the other, you hear their name, you see their 
face, you know, they have families and they have desires and dreams and aspirations and things to give, not just a scary caravan coming from Honduras like White Walkers. So, and I have interactive activities. So I hope you're all wearing your participants. If you guys could now go to menti.com. If you go to menti.com, it will ask you for a code. The code is 987374. And when you do that, you can do it on your phone. You can do it on another browser. You will see this question on your phone or your other browser. And one word answers. What barriers do Latinos face? Well, what's going to happen is that your answers are going to show up on the screen. One word answers, please. It, it's easier this way. Uh, it forms a word cloud. So all your responses will show up. If any answers are repeated, those words will grow and they will get bigger. The code is at the top of the screen. It's 987374. No problem. And how many people we got on the call? We got 22 people on the call. Cool. Down here, it'll tell me how many people have done it. So there's going to be a trivia game after two questions. So you're going to want to get in on this action. It's, it's legit. It's fun. So I'm seeing some words, racism, education, discrimination, prejudice, understanding, language, prejudice, stereotypes, miscommunication. Cool, yeah. Um, interesting, typically language is always the biggest one. Uh, which is it's kind of cool to see a different word in the big big center this time. They're all they're all right. Don't get me wrong. All these answers are correct. And the thing that uh, in public health this this doesn't have too many uh, examples. But like a lot of times when I do this, I see things like access to resources, transportation, insurance, you know, documentation status, um, mental health, and what we what I point out is that all of those other things, all the things besides language and whatnot, they impact health, right? These are the social determinants of health. So it's, it's the environment and the, the day, lived day-to-day -day experience and all the factors affecting it that impact health. 70% uh, of health outcomes are unrelated to health, not like being predisposed, uh, predisposed to a certain ailment or being sick outright. Uh, it has to do with all these pressures, anxieties, and um, income, and poverty, and nutrition, and education, and transportation. All these things compound and make health outcomes uh, uh, disparate, right? <laughs> the next question is, is this is uh, open-ended, so you can write more than one word. How do you build trust with Latino families? How would you get started? Yeah, sure, Emil. Good stuff. See, you guys don't need me. Look at all this. You guys got all the right answers right here. Uh, but yeah, I especially like share a meal. Absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice one. You might not get the opportunity to do that all the time, but if uh, any of you have interacted with Latinos and, then, and they're um, what do you call it? appreciative of you, you might be given a gift of something edible, right? Some, something they cooked, something they grew. 
you know, they, they might just be like, here you go, you know, thank you. Um, and, you know, I deal with a lot of people who go into the homes of families, and I understand there's policies in place where potentially uh, you cannot receive gifts or, uh, or even you're not comfortable eating whatever and in, in, in these gifts and foods, right? I get that. Dietary restrictions, whatever. What I do want to point out with this is that that act of giving that they're doing find a way to accept it. And one way you can do it is saying, oh, thank you very much. I'm actually not hungry right now, but can I, I'll eat it later. Can you package it? Or I'll just hang on to this for later, right? At least that gift was received and that relationship is strengthened. Um, so yeah, that's just one big pointer. Um, asking questions about them, of course. Yeah, people wanna feel like you care and that's how you can prove it is by being involved and interested. Oops, um, show curiosity. Why aren't you, why aren't you changing? Find the gatekeepers, absolutely. Does anybody wanna elaborate on that? Who said that? That was me. <laughs> um, that's just something we talked about in a outreach course I used to teach, just finding out who are, who are the people, who are the leaders of the community that can help spread the word about your programs and services? And how, how do you find these leaders, would you think? Ah, <laughs> um, let's see. You go to, you go, with, go into the community, go where they are. So go to festivals and events and um, invite yourself to those types of things. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, um, step one, call Pazos, right? We'll, we'll, we'll hook you up. Uh, everything we do is free. And, uh, and then also, yeah, you, the, the leaders in communities are, are surprising where they, where, they, where they exist. I mean, it could be a restaurant owner. It could be, um, you know, it, it's the people that everybody go to, right? The, the, the reliable, trusted people. And you're going to see that Pasos built our entire organization around that concept. Our, peop, our team, a lot of them were recipients of our services. And then we made space for them and saw their potential and, and grew roles for them to be more involved. Or they're just those people that care a lot and want to do something and, and they mean it. So they do all these things that you're saying here. They show curiosity. They're willing to learn. They are uh, warm and open and patient. And they spend time. So it's one of those things that you got to find these people. This isn't something you can train. This is something that's in people. You know, you either are this kind of person or not. Um, like we tell people, okay, you want um, more, more people, more Latinos, Spanish speakers coming into your office, your clinic, your library, getting a bilingual person, cool. But they better be a nice bilingual person because sometimes bilingual people are jerks. And you don't want a, a stink face person at the front making people feel uncomfortable, right? So, and I know that seems like common sense, but it is not. And it happens all the time. And so we, we help with that. You know, we help with the way that people recruit or even interview those kinds of things to, to get the right person. Um, find commonalities, yeah. Ask them questions about stuff. What did you do for the holidays? Tell me about it. Did you find the little Jesus in the cake? If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's culture. Um, baby Jesus in the cake. Many baby Jesus. Um, <laughs> anybody know anything about that? Anybody want to elaborate? I know about the baby Jesus in a king cake. Is it similar? That's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Whoever that's... finds it gets to buy it next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's called the Rosca de Reyes. It's a circle cake. And inside, it used to be all sorts of different things. But now today, you'll find these little plastic uh, baby Jesuses. And sometimes it's more than one. But if there is just one, yeah, you're responsible for this and that. Um, interesting tradition, right? You might, Latinos open their presents sometimes on New Christmas Eve. Um, you know, things like that. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm now going to quiz you on your Latino knowledge. You guys ready? All right, let me get this all set up real quick. All right.
Okay, so in this part of the mentee presentation, you will be putting your name in, or if you don't, one will be provided for you. And then you will compete by getting the answer correctly in the shortest amount of time and get the most points. I think there's seven questions. Whoever has the highest score is the ultimate Latino expert. <laughs> Very coveted prize and title. Got 11 people. 12. There's 22 of you out there. Thanks, 13 and 14. <laughs> All right, here we go. You other eight can watch. Here we go. Name this song. If you know Latino culture, you know this song. All right, six people, you got it right, yeah. La Vida es un Carnaval by Celia Cruz. That is the jam. Uh, if we had an anthem, that would be it. You hear that at all the weddings, quinceañeras, parties, backyards, whatever. You wanna see people get up? Put that song on. Here we go, let's see who got the high score. Earth man. <laughs> All right, I'm rooting for Earth Man, the strawberry. Let's go. Next question. What is the largest minority group in the United States? Latinos, yes, seven people got it right, good job. Uh, Latino population is roughly around uh, 50 million nationwide, uh, making up about 18% of the total population. It's predicted to go up to 30% by 2050. Second is African-American, which is roughly around 42 million nationwide. So close, very close. I have it, Earth Man. No. All right, let's go, McCabe. Come get him, Jabe. <laughs> I see you. All right, next question. South Carolina has the third fastest growing Latino population nationwide. True or false? It is true. We have a very fast growing population. And the word here is fast, very key, because we don't have the largest population. Big populations exist in like New York, California, Florida. Our population is relatively small, but it is growing rapidly, which means that we need to have the infrastructure in place to uh, accommodate these future leaders, neighbors, doctors, teachers, all the people that are gonna make up our society, they're a big part of it and they're growing. So uh, making sure that we you know, benefit from that asset uh, is important. Um, our population here is, is relatively young. Uh, we are a destination site because people move places that they know people, that they feel comfortable, that they have connections, they have jobs. Uh, so people are choosing South Carolina to relocate and 
those that tend to relocate are typically in a point in their lives where they can get up and go, you know, and imagine how scary that is. I mean, I moved here from California. That was a big move. Uh, imagine going somewhere you don't know the language, you don't know how the way the systems work, you know, you don't know anybody. Uh, it can be difficult. Um, and also, yeah, so if, so it's a young population. And uh, so it's rapidly growing because, you know, young populations, what are they going to do? They're going to grow populations, right? So, yeah, fueled by birth mostly. Ooh, hanging in there, kid. Wow, <laughs> by, a, by a thread. Okay, keep it up, keep it up. Next question. You can ask questions in the chat too. I see it. What South Carolina County has the highest Latino population? All over the place. Four people got it right. It's Greenville. Greenville has roughly 45,000 Latinos that, you know, all our numbers, I would say, are undercounted, you know, because we don't like to be counted. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of fear involved, right? Uh, Oh, yeah, we'll talk about the low country in a minute, uh, because the, the saturation is higher in the low country. That's the difference. Greenville is a big town, right? So Greenville, uh, like I said, the numbers are around 45,000, probably more, but that's the numbers that we have. And that's about 8.5% of Greenville's population. In the low country, the population of Latinos is only like 15,000, 20,000. But there are like high schools that they're more than 50% Latino, right? And the, that, that, that 20% that I, that 20,000 I just mentioned is more akin to like 15, 20% of the population, right? So the density is higher, which means there's more need, right? And not only that, numbers don't always reflect the need because Greenville has a lot of resources, right? Uh, especially for Latinos, there's Hispanic Alliance. And if you guys don't know them, look into them. They're a great resource. They work they focus and concentrate in Greenville, but they are expanding and they work outside of Greenville as well, but they, they do great things and uh, they're, they're partners of ours. Um, but the history of Greenville involves a connection with um, Colombia, the country in South America. There used to be a uh, textile mill industry that had a warehouse or a factory in Colombia and they started, and there was one in uh, Greenville, so they eventually, you know, people could move back and forth from Colombia to the States and, and work here, work there. So that was, uh, that started in like the 70s. So we saw a huge influx of Colombians coming to relocate to Greenville. But we also got to understand that this segment of Latinos coming out of Colombia, they belong to a different echelon of, uh, you know, class society because they moved here with a job ready for them, right? When they got here, they had a job. That's not every, not the case for everyone, and um, but yeah, you'll see you'll see independent little textile businesses, and a lot of times they're Colombian owned. You see a lot of Colombian restaurants in Greenville, um, but it's important to note the makeup of the different areas. Like I said, uh, Greenville, a lot of Colombians, but a lot of Latinos in general. But uh, in Saluda, for example, there's a lot of Guatemalans, and specifically Mom which is an indigenous group in Guatemala. So some of them don't even speak Spanish, but they find people who speak Spanish because that's closer to their community. And, you know, you find the people like you. Uh, Spartanburg, big population as well. Beaufort, a lot of people in the low country area, uh, they have ties to like Venezuela. We have a big Venezuelan population down there. And it, like I said, it has to do with people knowing people and um, different reasons for moving. Let's see who got that right. Who are you for people? Nice. All right. Sealing that lead. McCabe with an over a thousand point lead. But you never know. You never know. All right. Question five. Here we go. Ooh. 
Which country do most of South Carolina's Latinos originate? I got you with all that Columbia talk, didn't I? So <laughs> I got, uh, that's just Greenville. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the majority are from Mexico. Um, does anybody want to take a guess why? Proximity? Yeah, there's lots of reasons. So proximity is definitely one of them. Um, you know, it's walking distance, essentially. But uh there's there's many reasons um because of our arrangement and our our our, um, our relationship with the nation state of mexico and how large it is and how much of a key piece of our economy they are the north american free trade agreement really opened up a lot of um, uh, visas available so there's an allotment of visas per country and you know that's based on and we have very scrupulous rules on who gets um a visa, right? You can't, not everyone can get one. So, but uh, Mexico has like 350,000 visas a year that they allocate, where smaller countries, maybe 30 to uh, thirty to 80,000 uh, visas, depending on the country. So it's all relational, but also, yeah, people are looking to um, start a new life, right? Um, they're, they might be in some precarious situation where they need to find safety, uh, environmental, social, gangs, violence, those kinds of things. Um, but it's not always, and not everybody wants to leave Mexico <laughs> to come here. Many people are very content. Um, so yeah, what was that comment? The Columbia answers show that we're listening, right? What? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. But, oh, Columbia, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, awesome, you guys are listening. And what's cool too is that I didn't get anybody with my trick answer on this one. Anybody want to take a... Stab at which one's the trick answer and why? Puerto Rico. Yeah, why? Can't get away. You can't. Nah, you're still on the hook. Come over. <laughs> it's a part <laughs> of the United States. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but you know, that's some people don't know that. So I get some people on this one. Um, yes, they are a Spanish speaking territory, uh, but they have been part of us since 1917. They have citizenship, but we do have a lot of Puerto Ricans here. Why? Why so many Puerto Ricans here? Similar environment, like yeah, weather. Of, I, I will. I will give you guys a long silence when there's a lot of answers. <laughs> so yes, yes, lot, uh, similar environments. Um, weather by like hurricanes could push people out, right? Um, they know people, that kind of stuff. But also, being a citizen allows you to do what? You're on mute, McCabe. I saw you though. Travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, travel, but also join, join the military, right? Oh, yeah. Join the military. And so we have a lot of service oh, yeah. that relocate to places that have bases. So we have bases. And uh, so for that reason, you might see some Puerto Ricans showing up. Um, see who got that right. No, McCabe! <laughs> Uh, you still got a thousand on Bill. So here you got two questions left. Better keep it. There you go. Next question. What percentage of South Carolina's population are Latino? I forgot some. I might have even thrown out the answer.
I actually give two right answers for this one because the numbers are underrepresented and I don't like that. So we all, we oftentimes underrepresent our numbers, but it's closer to 8.5%. And because of the growth of the youth, those numbers are getting even higher. Those are more close to 10 to 15%. Uh, so the future is going to be much more Latino here. Um, and like I said, it's not the largest um, number, like it's about 300,000. But I would also like to say why, you know, and how things get underrepresented. So the census just happened. And remember that whole skerfuffle about the um, documentation and whether or not you're a citizen, is that gonna be on the, on the census? Well, even just talking about it, I mean, that, that shook some people off. You know what I mean? They're not gonna, they're not gonna do it. You know, what's in it for them? They don't know that $10,000 goes to every county by each person that fills out the census that's going to go to their schools, their roads, their libraries, their fire departments. Yeah, no, it was intentional. And it scared a lot of people. And that makes our numbers go down and it hurts our communities. Oh, Bill! <laughs> and we have a race okay last question 50 50 shot true false ready here we go a translator and an interpreter are the same thing true or false mccabe don't get distracted <laughs> the answer is false all right yes very good very good let's see how fast mccabe and bill were i saw her got a little distracted there i don't know if that cost her some points let's see no oh, she got some points nice okay oh <laughs> Winner, McCabe! Everybody give an applause, silent applause. Hold on, let me mute myself. I'm gonna mute myself in applause, hold on. Silent applause. Good, 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 awesome. Thank you, thanks for playing everybody. All right, so any questions? Oops, wow, why did that scroll? It's weird. You know your mouse wheel scrolls your PowerPoints? I am today's today years young to know that. Um, so when we're talking about South Carolina, we have roughly 5 million people that live here. The darker counties are more saturated, higher density populations in general. We're talking about all people here. Um, and then the lighter, lighter uh, color counties have less people. So when we start thinking about resources how do you think this map overlaps with a map of like resources what would you think one would hope that resources would be distributed as needed based on population density uh i don't think that's what happens yeah <laughs> you're new here um so, <laughs> uh true they tend to concentrate where people are right in the darker areas those are where more resources are in the lighter areas there's less which means it's going to take extra effort to go to those places to make sure that those days those places do get the same fair treatment um that that requires equity that requires extra attention based on the specific needs of a community that's my definition of equity putting in the effort needed and to see the, the benefits of having that kind of stability. So let's talk about South Carolina's breakdown according to race. So I gave you guys the, you know, over here, I got the 5.8, right? Uh, but 8.5, uh, but here we got like white, 65%, black, 27%, you know, uh, and everything else is kind of small at that point, right? Just noticing, Black, 65%, white, or no, sorry, white, 65%, black, 27% in the state. 
it's important to note because I'm going to show you uh, how racial disparities express themselves. I did a, a talk for the University School of Law, and all I did was pull up juveniles in detention by race. And this is what I found, Richland County, uh, black, 85% of juveniles in detention are black, 55% of the state. White, 12% of county, 40% of state. Remember, black, 27% total, white, 65% total. Black, 85%, white, 12% of detained juveniles. Doesn't take a whole lot to see that something's going on, right? <laughs> so what is that? And what are we gonna do about it? Is it one racist cop? No, it's systems. And it's systems that shape trajectories, lived experiences, and perceptions, and biases, and access. How's that work? So you walk up to a lake, you see a dead fish. What do you think? Pollution, don't drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, sure, maybe. But maybe what else could have happened to that fish? Nothing for it to eat. No food to eat. Maybe, maybe it got, um, hooked by a fisherman and it looks like it kind of maybe gouged his eyeball out who knows right or you know <laughs> maybe it got into a fight you know you know what i've seen fish like these these fish are known fish gang members you know they do fish drugs and do fish bad behaviors you know it's actually the fish's fault that this happened to them you know because it's just the way that it was raised you know it's just, it's just the way that fish are. And then you might walk up to a lake and see this. 85% fish. What do you start thinking now? It's more of a problem with the environment and the surroundings rather than one fish. Yes. What's in that water? Where's that water coming from? What feeds into that water? What is going on with the system? Latino children, 37% of children, oh, 37% of Latino children in our state live in poverty, compared to 23% overall. Huge disparity there. If you take your phone and turn your camera on and put it over that QR code, it'll send you to a website called Salud America, and it's a county report card. You can select your specific county that you live in, and it'll produce a PDF that has stats. This is all Latinos in your area. Stats on how many? One in six children are Latino. It gives you stats on diploma, you know, high school graduation rates, insurance rates, uh, diabetes, COVID-19 response, housing, transportation, so many things. It's a great resource. Download that PDF, check it out. Um, it's, it's um, you know, lots of good information there. This is stuff that I've pulled from that resource. So Latino children, 42% live in childcare deserts, an impact on their school readiness and, and education ability to, you know, tutor and be nurtured. 40% of Latino children younger than five uh, are participating in preschool compared to 53% of everybody else. And uh, yeah, so these are major contributors to school readiness. And if you see the chart, I was looking at uninsured versus uninsured Latinos versus uninsured non-Latinos. And it's almost like triple. And then Latinos without a diploma and the non-Latinos without a diploma. And that's also almost triple. Right. Here's some stats on the population densities throughout our state. And there we go with Greenville, right? The 8.5, which reflects our state's average, around 43,000, the highest in the state. But then I said Beaufort, right? 11 to 15%, depending, but it's only about 20,000. But the, the ratio there is important, like I said. Got to have more bilingual folks, got to have counselors, all that kind of stuff. Okay.
So this is a video that I'm going to share. It's five minutes long, and it is a training video that we created for DHHS for them to, uh, you know, better understand the Latino community. You might recognize the voice. Here we go. What are some of the ways we can better serve our Latino and Hispanic neighbors? This video has been designed to help clarify the difference between terms like Hispanic and Latino and provide useful examples for culturally appropriate ways to better serve Latino and Hispanic individuals. So who is Hispanic and who is Latino? Hispanic is a linguistic term that applies to those who speak Spanish. The Spanish language originated in Spain but spread during the 1500s as Spanish explorers colonized most of Central America, South America, and much of North America's western coast. The New World, as it was called then, was neither empty nor new. There were people there with languages of their own and cultures specific to their areas. This means different foods grown in different environments and climates, architecture, social norms, beliefs, societal structures, and ways of being. As a result, there are currently indigenous cultures and communities throughout what we call Latin America that are bilingual, speaking Spanish and their indigenous language, and some who solely speak Oops. speak an indigenous language. For example, in Guatemala alone, there are 21 nationally recognized indigenous languages. In Brazil, the largest country in Latin America, the national language is Portuguese, not Spanish. To add another layer of complexity, people from all over the world settled in this part of the Western Hemisphere over the course of the last 500 years, bringing their language and cultural influences with them as well. With all of this in mind, Hispanic, with its definition being Spanish-speaking, doesn't work for everyone throughout Latin America. Latino is a term meaning anyone from Latin America, spanning across language, race, and identity. Fifth-generation Italian immigrants from Argentina are Latino, just as their Aztec-descendant Mexican neighbors to the north are. Latinos have a long history as part of the culture and fabric of the United States. In 1848, Mexico ceded large portions of their land to the United States with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the Gadsden Purchase of 1853. People living in the areas that are now Texas, Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming went from being Mexican to American with the signing of this treaty. Additionally, the United States has claimed other Latin American territories, such as Puerto Rico, extending U.S. citizenship to them as well in 1917. There are over 50 million Latinos in the United States, making them the largest minority group representing about 18% of United States total population. It is predicted that this number will grow to 30% by 2060. For the last 10 years, South Carolina has been in the top five states with the fastest growing Latino population. Across South Carolina, there are over 270,000. South Carolina has seen a 900% increase in the Latino child population. Currently, that growth is fueled by birth. According to the New American Economy August 2016 report, Latinos in South Carolina paid $345.6 million in taxes. That's $230.7 million federal and $114.9 million state and local. The United States is made up of individuals that belong to a wide range of races, religions, genders, disabilities, national origins, and ages. Individuals who have limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English are considered to be limited English proficient individuals. Discrimination against an individual because of the limited ability to use the English language is a form of national origin discrimination, which is prohibited by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Here are some additional tips on working with Latino individuals. Remember that there is a lot of diversity within the Latino population. Be careful not to make assumptions about language proficiency levels, country of origin, or documentation status. Latinos value relationships. Shake hands and greet them by name or ask what they prefer to be called. Eye contact with people of authority may be avoided as a sign of respect. When a Latino person nods their head, it does not necessarily signify agreement. 
It may also signify that the person is listening to you. Silence can often signify not understanding or disagreement. To ensure understanding, ask open-ended questions and encourage them to ask questions. Because the family is an important source of emotional support, customers may like to have their family members present during an interview. Latino immigrants tend to be more relaxed over time. It is important to begin any meeting with an informal and relaxed exchange of personal or family information before beginning to work on tasks related to the meeting's purpose. Just as with all customers, provide information in a courteous manner and listen attentively. Thank you for watching this video presentation, and we hope this information will help you better serve South Carolina's Latino families. For more information, please visit www.scpasos.org. A lot of good information in there, right? Anything new? Anything that was thought-provoking or new? Would you mind uh, telling the Latino definition again? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I know that's a big hit. Uh, so people are very concerned about what term to use, Hispanic, Latino, and then there's more. Um, Biggest advice I would say is uh, don't make it weird. Don't make it weird, baby. You know, just 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 don't be like you know that one Hispanic family. You know, just just be cool. Uh, but as a whole, ask. You know, what what term do you like to use for yourself? You know, uh, but the definitions are. Oh yeah, don't call us late for dinner. That's the thing. Um, Hispanic means Spanish speaking, which means you could be from Spain and be Hispanic, but not Latino. Latino means regional. So anywhere from this land mass, that is Latino, which means you could speak a different language, but be from here and be Latino. Indigenous folks, Portuguese, whatnot. Now, we have this other term coming up, Latinx, right? Have you guys heard that one before? Okay, so Latinx is new. Uh, and there's other terms coming out, and I'll talk about those in a second. But I really like Latinx to dissect why it exists, what, what reason does it have to do that whole X thing, right? So I'm a poet. I'm a singer in a band. So I'm going to share with you some of my poetry. Here we go. Latinx marks the spot where a coliseum full of women no longer surrender when a man walks in the door. Latinx marks the spot where patriarchy ends. Let me break that down for you. Let's imagine 50,000 women in a Coliseum. The Spanish term for they is gendered, so it's ellas. Right? But what if I show up? What? Here I am. Like a what? Hurricane. But in this case, since I just showed up, it's a hemicane. Ha! Yeah. So 50,000 women in a Coliseum plus one dude. All of a sudden, it's Ayos. Sorry, ladies. I'm here. You have to be called something else because I'm here. Don't you dare call me an Aya. All you get to be called Ayos instead. Ha, 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 ha. Right? Well, that's power. Right? There's a lot of power there. So Latinx is like, you know what? We're not going to play that game. We're just going to ungender the language. We're going to put an X at the end. We're going to make space for our trans folks, our non binary folks, and make it something that doesn't perpetuate this power imbalance between the genders. So that's why it exists. Is it perfect? No. Does everybody like it? No. Uh, will anybody ever like any term? No. So will we keep using Latinx forever? Probably not, but it doesn't really matter. We're talking about it and that's what matters. Uh, so <laughs> there's another term called Latine with an E at the end. Uh, that one, some people are preferring because it, it's a little bit more uh, phonetic, right? It, it's easier to pronounce than Latinx, 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 or if you want to go indigenous, Latinx. Uh, but 
Yeah, that's why it exists. In Latine, there are movements to change the gendered nature of Spanish. So some people are like, don't change our language, da, da, da. but like I said, culture is alive, culture changes based on what people agree upon and enough people push for something, it'll change. So they're starting to change words like ellos is, some people are starting to use ellos with an ES at the end. So just, just Latinx is a term that you will hear most commonly used by academics and activists. So know your audience. I wouldn't show up to a, a gathering of grandmas, Latino grandmas and call them Latinx. You know what I mean? <laughs> I would use Latino uh, in that case. Latinas, right? Okay. So what are some phrases and to, that get used that are not great? And what are some better ones? What are you? Where are you from? Right? <laughs> these things get said. Better ways to say these things. What is your background? What is your cultural heritage? Oops, I had other terms there. Ah! Uh, I had like, how do you identify? What are your pronouns? That kind of stuff, sorry. And if we're talking about terms, alien, definitely not very nice, uh, very dehumanizing. I mean, the literal not humanness of it is very dehumanizing. Um, and we got a weird thing with aliens, man. So here we're being called aliens. Oh wait, but maybe, you know, all those ruins that we made? aliens couldn't have been us right couldn't have been those guys had to be somebody way more advanced not those guys illegals not a nice term ah, right individuals who are undocumented and i'm sure that will change too right so just be reflective check in on what's most controversial and what is the most accepted terms you got to understand what the myths are that we're dealing with, the way that people perceive us, right? This isn't really a myth, but it just popped in my head. When people see us, they think things, right? And it's regional. In California, my Latino-ness is way different than South Carolina, my Latino-ness, right? Here, I am exotic. You know, in California, I am Michael Frederick Young. You know, no R, no Ike, no Ñ in my name, but here, right? So <laughs> I went to a, spent, a Mexican restaurant and I got up to go to the bathroom and one of the tables asked me to get them a to-go box. People see me, people see my skin, they see, and they make, they make assumptions. So some of the myths that we deal with, taking jobs, they took her jobs, right? South Park, and being lazy, those, and like, how does that work, right? I mean, how can you simultaneously be stealing a job and being too lazy to work? But these are things that get said and they exist at the same time. They contradict each other, it doesn't matter. It's a myth, right? We could talk about those people all we want. But the, and then so I've actually even had people say, wait, I've, I've, I mean, I've heard, I've always heard they're hardworking. You know, I've, I've never heard this lazy thing. I was like, really? Have you never driven down the freeway? Like for $12.99, you can go to the racist relic monuments and buy a $12 uh, towel with Sleepy Pedro uh, with a sombrero on a cactus. This is our caricature. This is our mammy. It doesn't really get questioned a whole lot. And it perpetuates a certain myth. There's a restaurant in Irmo that opened up recently called Pedro's. And when I saw it open, I saw it sign has it, its name written in cursive and then like a Speedy Gonzalez character, you know, sombrero, food, margarita. And I was just thinking about the thought process of those people that made that, um, that restaurant, that sign. I was like, you know, they probably looked at that. They're like, hmm, okay, it says Pedro's. That's good. I like that. It's, that's, it's a restaurant name. But can we get a sign with an alcoholic rat? I think that might really sell it. You know what I mean? Why are these our things? Why? Why? So, yeah. But the reality is, is that immigrants compete with each other for the same jobs and they elevate nat native born residents. How do they do that? If there's a workforce that is largely monolingual, let's say Spanish speaking, construction, cleaning, back of house at restaurants, anything that's labor intensive, really, you can have a workforce that's largely Spanish speaking as long as there's some sort of manager that is also a Spanish speaker. All right, but now let's say you're an entry-level um, person trying to get into some sort of workforce. 
you might start in those types of work environments. All right. Well, what if a promotion comes up? Manager, front of house, server. The person that speaks English is going to get that job. Right? So taking jobs. <laughs> we make jobs. And also, I have when I have a longer training, I did three hours yesterday and I ran out of time. Uh, and I had people moving around and having fun and, and thinking about stuff hardcore. But um, I walk through the immigration history. I what did I just talk about? Yeah, the jobs. Oh yes, I have a uh, one of my buddies in Guatemala. Trilingual, he speaks Spanish, English, and ex Chi Maya. He worked for Time Warner Cable and then Citibank. He was one of those phone guys. You know, when he worked for Time Warner Cable, he's the guy that you call and he's like, "Have you turned off? Can you unplug your router and plug it back in?" Right, but. So he gets paid what comes out to $4 an hour by these corporations that provide jobs here too. So they didn't take the job. They, well, they did. They took it and went to Guatemala with it because they can pay them $4 an hour for it, right? So it's not <laughs> the blame, right? Where's the blame? Uh, <laughs> so now we're going to play a true false myth game. Reality is myth game. There have been female presidents in Latin America for over 40 years. True or false? I don't know how I'm going to get. Just put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Good job, McCabe. Yes. <laughs> so, like I said, uh, we get dinged with our machismo, right? We, 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 we get it told that very macho, very macho machismo culture. But there's been female presidents in Latin American countries for over 40 years. They got us beat by 40 years, y'all. And we're not just talking about one country. We're talking about like six or seven, right? 40 years. Also, by the way, slavery was abolished in Guatemala in 1832. Not till 1867 here. All right. The majority of undocumented individuals arrive by illegally crossing the border. True or false? Thanks, Susan. False. Yeah. That does happen, of course. But the majority, like I said, remember those visas that get handed out for workers and stuff? So, you know, they qualify and then they get the visa and they come here. And they might have all intentions to do the normal thing. The normal thing might be work in Buford for two months, go up to Virginia, work in that agricultural field for two months, keep going, whatever. There's a path. There's a, there's a, a journey that these people get relocated on when they're visa migrant workers. Well, sometimes the farmers are like, man, Adolfo, you're awesome. I like you. Why don't you and your family stay? I'll pay you, you know. I know your thing's gonna expire, but you know, what do you think? That happens all the time. People just let their visas expire and then they become undocumented and then they have no path to citizenship. But it's, it's a risk people are willing to take sometimes. Farm workers and laborers from Latin America are un or undereducated. is right. Uh, a lot of times people are relocating and they might, like we had people on our team that were doctors in Peru and, you know, they're community health workers here. They couldn't get a doctor job here. They, they're, they're, um, we don't accept all the credentials from other countries, right? So sometimes you've, you have to just do what you can and bait because of discrimination, sometimes that limits you to a job that was definitely a few, you know, um, tiers lower than what you were doing back at home. Age discrimination is not only legal, but encouraged in some parts of Latin America. True or false? <laughs> yes, it is true. Uh, if you ever go into like a bank or any place like a government, I mean, mostly a bank. Uh, in Latin America, it's like walking into a beauty contest. You know, everybody there's beautiful. You know, just 
glamorous and they legitimately have it on their applications must be between 18 and 25 to apply do not apply if you're not older that that we don't they don't have the same laws that we have so those who fall without of these ages have less chances have less ability to get jobs and even people who are elderly they have a really hard time you see them being like the trash people in towns because that's really all they have available not i'm not saying all but i'm saying this is common <laughs> you know what i'm saying um okay all latinos have brown skin dark hair and are short true or false yeah we talked about that lots and lots of different latinos <laughs> and the amount of tax contributions by latino immigrants outweighs government spending on social services they receive True. Yeah. I mean, everybody pays taxes. That video showed you the millions of dollars that come from Latinos in taxes. Uh, you, can't, you can't get around paying taxes. And that goes into emergencies, fire departments, police, all these things. And if you are undocumented or if you're just discriminated against, you might avoid these things. You might not go to the hospital. You might not call the police. You might not uh, go to the emergency room. So and the ones that we that do, and the, the spending that does get spent, like I said, it's less than those that are contributing. Okay, micrograms. Okay, we have options right now. Okay, um, let me see here. I only have seven minutes. Let me be selective. All right. Um, I can. Do you guys want to know about? Microaggressions, implicit bias. You want to hear a story? You want to hear about PASO specifically? Somebody, somebody read it. Somebody choose from those three options. Story, microaggressions, and implicit bias, or organizational, how we can work with you. Somebody, anybody. I like stories. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. I'd like to also hear about like um, pesos too. I actually, um, while I was working on my master's, we did, well, each person had to do a um, community synopsis and find an underserved population and how we could do that. And so I focused on the Casey West Columbia branch um, of the Lexington Library and focused on the um, Latinx community. And looked at ways that they, that a library can make it more open for people to feel safe coming in, like having someone that's bilingual, having signage out front that is um, in both the languages so that people aren't worried about being reported because of not being documented and that sort of stuff, so that they are able to come in and use our resources. And I say our, like the community's resources and feel welcome and a part of the community that they are, so. Anyway. Yeah, that's excellent. <laughs> um, one, one advice that I like to give organizations and partners, if they don't have bilingual staff and they want to somehow increase that, uh, that connection, reach out to colleges or organizations or, or anybody you might know that might be connected to a Spanish speaker and do like a walkthrough video. It could be on a phone. It doesn't have to be professional and just be like, Hi, welcome to wherever in Spanish, right? So this is a Spanish video. Hi, welcome to wherever. Let's go on in. Walk in. Hi, this is this person. This is who you might meet. And oh, you can go over here and it, and then have that available. It's free. It's uh, easy to make, and it'll it'll give people an idea of what to uh, what to expect in in your wherever you are. Right. Uh, I'm gonna just give you a piece of this microaggressions video, and then. Uh, This is young girls expressing what they do. Oh, you're so pretty for a black girl. Oh, she has a Jew nose. Oh, your hair would look so good if it was straight. Jews are so cheap. Why are you so cheap? Do you speak um, good English? How are you an Iraqi Jew? I think the person saying microaggression kind of doesn't really think about it. This person who said it was my friend, and like, I was astonished that they would like say something like that. You don't want to make a big deal about it, but then it's also like, you just said something that offended me, so I feel like I should speak up. Because they're micro, because 
they're um, very subtle, they, they're small. You feel like you don't have a reason to be upset. You're overreacting and people even can make you feel that way when you bring it up. They're like, oh, you can't take a joke. You're making too big of a deal of this. Why are you overreacting? Don't take it so seriously. It was just a joke. Chill out. Say like, oh no, I actually love black people. I love people of color. Like, they try to just minimize the situation. If someone feels hurt by a microaggression, it shouldn't just be pushed to the side. It definitely has negative impacts and like leads to people disliking who they actually are. So yeah. Those are microaggressions, and they happen all the time. It's based on assumptions and not full knowledge of people's experience or what they're all about. Um, so careful with that. Um, these are the things Latinos deal with. These are the social determinants of health I mentioned earlier, right? Illiteracy, poverty, insurance, healthcare systems, transportation, fear, bullying, anti-immigration laws and policies, stress and fear of family separation, uh, ways to overcome implicit bias, Read books uh, written by different authors, different histories, different backgrounds. Art, people are expressing themselves in poetry, museums, music. Check it out, right? Get a sense. You might not feel comfortable going up to a person from Uruguay and being like, yo, tell me about Uruguay. But if you go read something about Uruguay first, you might feel a little bit more comfortable asking, right? Um, movies directed by people from different backgrounds. Uh, and be aware of the discriminations that exist. Myths, taking jobs, lazy, stuff like that. Um, skip this. This is Bella Rosa Guardado uh, as she's visiting the Tijuana, California border 40 years after she crossed from the 1970s. Her brother, her uncle, and her decided Central America, it's been ramped up for civil war, you know, corporate and state interests on resources, labor, all these things, you know. It, it, we can do more, we want to be more. So they decided we're going to go to El Norte. So her, her brother and uncle, she's 17, go. The Coyote say, if you get caught, hide all your information so that they don't send you all the way back. They'll just drop you off in Mexico. So they, they're like, okay, don't say you're together either. So they go, get there, get caught. Brother and uncle were not convincing. She was, she was left in Tijuana. She was there for two weeks by herself, 17, doesn't know anyone. Sixth grade education, doesn't speak English. And after two weeks of trying every day, pretty much, she met a family that said, if you get across, we'll call us, we'll, we'll pick you up. On the fifth try in one day, she crossed, called that number, and they made good on it. And they told her, we'll help you get a job. Looked in the newspaper, found a live-in housekeeper nanny. And it was with a husband and a wife and their two young sons. So she lived in there, took care of them. And after about a year, the relationship between the husband and wife weren't, wasn't doing so great, so they separated. But the dad of the house um, was uh, invested and interested, and they spent a lot of time together, and he took her to English classes and, and all that good stuff. Have you ever seen the movie Spanglish? Well, that started to happen, right? They started falling in love. And so she went from being a factory worker to a factory manager to uh, being relocated to uh, Puerto Rico to oversee a warehouse there because she's bilingual now. She eventually became a computer components engineer and she was part of the prototype team that created the pulsometer thing that goes on your finger from Massimo, earning like six figures, right? So that potential was realized and activated and nurtured by people caring, him caring and, and putting effort into it. Here they are a little bit later, right? And that's what Pasos is all about doing, connecting people, strengthening them, and getting them where they need to be. And I know this story really well because that's my mom and these are my parents. So I've always wondered why the world works the way it works. Why do we have different histories? I am half white, half El Salvadoran. I call myself cafe con leche. Uh, and I have always been like, how am I? I can't be one or the other. I'm never a full human. I am not white, I'm not brown. I'm never enough to be either one. So I studied cultural anthropology to understand how people make meaning and how do people even know what they are and how, what is all that all about? Now I'm sharing all that with you guys. So um, let me show you what PASOS is all about. So PASOS started out navigating women through their pregnancies to get care, Latino women, and then uh, start grouping together moms. And you get a bunch of fired up Latino mamas in a room, they're gonna get some stuff done. So. They started getting all their neighbors signed up. It was starting to work. Everybody noticed. So we blew up into a multi-site 
you know, uh, organization throughout the state, you know, of all the epic go-to people in, in the local communities. Um, we are community health workers, promotoras. We know how to navigate, you know, healthcare systems, SNAP with Medicaid. We will sit down with people, do the application with them. We'll check on them, make sure that their application got accepted, set up their, their, um, their um, appointments, check back after the appointments. It's all about that follow through, right? That's how you develop that trust. So check in, don't just hand a flyer or a pamphlet and walk away. You know, it's not gonna work. So very much a intimate kind of relationship you form with your, your um, participants. And, and then they end up, a lot of them end up joining the team and doing what you did for them for others. Um, but yeah, we're all around the state. Go to our website, find out where we are, but you can hit up, you can hit me up, ask me any questions you want and I will direct you in the right direction. So this is just like an overview, I know. But um, last cool little quotes here. Uh, Paulo Freire, love this guy. A change maker is marked by their ability to trust others, to believe in the capacity of others to think. The solutions for problems exist in the communities that are experiencing them. Those that are closest to the problem are usually the furthest from the resources. So it is our job to leverage our privilege and our access so that we can create the solutions that they dream of. And one of the approaches that community health workers take, I like this. This woman says, I let them know that I have struggles too. I let them know that they are not alone. I let them talk about their fears. And I offer them encouragement by saying, where you see yourself now is not where you will always be. And I like that approach. It's temporary. There's going to be growth. I'm here for it. I've gone through something similar. That's going to help you build trust. Uh, don't worry about the mentee, but thank you guys. Thank you. That was awesome. So much good information. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Go ahead it. and stop the recording. Um,